Okay, so we'd like to begin this session. Uh, this is a special session about the work of the National Academy related to supporting the fellows and enhancing professional development. And we are having this session, I mentioned this yesterday in the business meeting, partly in acknowledgement of Susan Furman's great commitment to professional development and to the fellows program. So we wanted to have a way to showcase some of that work and we hope to have an interesting conversation. I think as most of you know, uh, Michael Foyer has certainly made it clear, Susan has made it clear, one of the Academy's greatest commitments is to nurturing the development of the next generation of researchers whose work over time will focus on education. In order to do that, we've been working uh, since Susan's presidency on a unified approach to professional development that includes the idea of intergenerational mentoring, joint retreats, and extended opportunities to think about professional development in a coherent way over the course of the lifespan, at least through the period of time when people, people are called former fellows. Although we have some folks in the audience like Chris Guterres, who was a fellow 25 <laughs> years ago. She, she said it out loud. It's okay. And, and, so, and they still speak of the impact of that on their work. So what we've decided to do in this session is we want to explore these fellowship programs from a number of different angles, and we hope that this will provoke some interesting conversation. And so our plan is to keep the comments of these six panelists to seven minutes each, which may be a good trick, but that's our plan, and then to open this up to discussion. So let me tell you what, who these folks are. I'm going to introduce everybody at once, uh, and then as they're speaking, please jot down some notes for questions that you might want to add at the end. So we've asked... Oh, I meant We've asked Larry Hedges and Adam Gameron to talk about their evaluation of the National Academy slash Spencer uh, Postdoc Fellowship Program and Dissertation Fellows Program, which was reported in this book, which some of you probably have read and some of you probably never read, uh, called Learning to Work Better. This was published in 2010. Uh, the report has two major parts. One is the statistical evaluation led by Larry Hedges, and so he's going to speak first. It's the first section of the report. Um, and then there is an analysis uh, of alternative approaches to human capital development led by Adam Gameron, and he will speak about that portion. Larry Hedges, who's a member of the Academy, is the Board of Trustees Professor of Statistics and Psychology and Professor in the School of Educational and Social Policy at Northwestern. Adam Gameron, also an Academy member, became the president just in September of the William T. Grant Foundation. Previously, he was the John D. MacArthur Professor of Sociology and Educational Policy Studies and director of the Wisconsin Center for Education Research at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Next, we've asked three former fellows to describe their experiences and perspectives as dissertation and or postdoc fellows, what we asked them to do was to think about the value and impact of the Academy's fellowship programs on the individual level and about the role the fellowships have played and perhaps are continuing to play in their scholarly work. We are especially interested in here, and we said this to them, in their thoughts and suggestions about the intergenerational aspects of professional development and mentoring, as well as their ideas about the program's strengths and needs. So in alphabetical order, and I think this is how they're sitting, uh, we are going to hear from Laura Munoz, who received a uh, Academy Spencer Postdoc Fellowship in, Laura, what year? 2011. 2011. She's an associate professor of American history at Texas A&M, Corpus Christi. Her research focuses on educational history and reform, including Mexican-American education in Arizona. Then we're going to hear from Thomas Phillip, who received a postdoc fellowship in 2010. He's assistant professor 
in the Urban Schooling Division Graduate School of Education and Information Studies at UCLA. His research focuses on the ideological context, including racial ideology, that shape teachers' work. And then we're going to hear from Emily Rauscher, who was a 2011 dissertation fellow. She's now assistant professor of sociology at the University of Kansas. Her research focuses on intergenerational inequality and education, stratification, and gene-environment interactions. Finally, rounding out the panel and taking us in a different direction, and this is very purposeful, we've asked Lois Weiss, who is also an Academy member, to talk about some of the larger social and historical issues related to the application and selection processes of fellowship programs like these programs. Here we ask her to pay particular attention to whether, <clears throat> excuse me, and how fellowships of this kind reproduce existing systems of privilege and disadvantage in the education scholarly community and how these issues might be addressed. Lois is State University of New York Distinguished Professor of Sociology of Education at the University of Buffalo, State University of New York. She's written extensively about the complex roles gender, class, and race play in youth's lives. And then the way we have organized this, as I said, we really hope then to have audience participation, questions, comment, and so on. And we're going to allow each speaker to either stand up here or sit down, whichever they prefer. I think you can see everybody and hear everybody. So uh, Larry is going to begin. Okay, I think I'll stand up there so I can push the button. For oh, okay. <laughs> Well, I'm going to speak very briefly about an evaluation, a uh, statistical evaluation that I carried out of the two uh, National Academy-related uh, fellowship programs, one being the, uh, this, the dissertation fellowship program, the other being the postdoc program. The first evaluation we did, actually, was of the postdoc program, and the origin of it was uh, that at some point, the Academy became interested in whether or not we could marshal any evidence about the effectiveness of the program in improving people's research careers and various things like that. Uh, I had served on the selection committee for eight years and happened to be on the board of the NAE at the time when the discussion arose, and I was guilty of having some ideas about how you might do this, and uh, that's why I got involved. Um, <laughs> The basic questions we were trying to, to answer in both these evaluations were whether or not the fellowship program enhanced the careers of people who received the fellowships. That was the main question. So the question then could be sharpened a little bit to, to, uh, to emphasize the counterfactual. Did the fellows have more successful research careers or, or academic careers uh, than they would have had if they hadn't received the fellowship? And a secondary question was whether or not the careers that the fellows had were more engaged with education than they might have been if they hadn't received fellowships. That has been an important function of these programs, to sort of draw people from other disciplines into into education. The, um, uh, The basic strategy we used to carry out the evaluations was what you might call a regression discontinuity strategy. Uh, the idea was to compare uh, how the fellows did with how they, we estimate they might have done had they not received a fellowship. Uh, the, uh, each of these evaluations focused on outcomes some years after people received their fellowship in order to, for the, the effects of the fellowship of, to have time to, to kick in. And each of them evolved about a decade's worth of fellows. Uh, so this was a uh, reasonably uh, large set of fellows and non-fellows, and uh, there are a variety of stories. I could tell you about, for example, how we uh, managed to get people who hadn't received fellowships uh, to uh, help us with uh, data collection, but uh, people were generous, and we were able to do that. I actually just want to say a, a few words about the outcome measures we used, because I think the purpose of this session is to have a discussion, as I understand, and the outcome measures that we happen to choose uh, may be one of the things that, that uh, are worth talking about. Uh, essentially, we looked at the literature and asked the question, how do people evaluate university faculty? How do people evaluate academic careers? 
And there were some fairly simple answers to that. Uh, first and perhaps foremost is research productivity. Uh, we happen to measure research productivity in terms of numbers of books and articles, book chapters, edited volumes, uh, book reviews that fellows and uh, non-fellows produced. We gave a lot of thought to the question of whether they should be considered singly or all together, and if they're considered together, should, they be wait should there be some weighting scheme? Uh, ultimately, it turned out not to matter very much. The same picture kind of emerged uh, no matter uh, what. Uh, second important area that faculty are evaluated in terms of is their influence on the work of others. Uh, it's not just sufficient to produce a lot of stuff. Ideally, uh, your work will have an impact on the thinking and the research of others. Uh, here, we chose measures of citation, you know, citation, citation counts, not a big surprise, and editorial service, where the people were, how, to the, to what extent were people in a position to influence um, the uh, kinds of work that found its way into journals. Uh, thirdly, for most kinds of research that we do, uh, support uh, in the form of money is, um, is necessary. And I guess uh, the fact that people were applying for fellowship support means that the kind of work they were doing uh, actually required uh, outside support. So we looked at uh, the receiving of federal grants and non-federal grants of various kinds. We thought that we'd be able to do some clever stuff with the uh, prestige of uh, the departments or universities that individuals found themselves in, uh, but we convinced, we convinced ourselves that we couldn't do anything very, uh, very sensible about that when considering a fellowship program as broad as the NAE programs. Uh, we were stuck with just uh, asking questions like, well, did the person, in the case of the pre-doctoral fellowships, complete their, their dissertation and, and receive their degree? And in the, case of the, um, in the case of both programs, did they attain the rank of, of full professor? It, was, it turned out to be a, something you could look at. And finally, um, and this was a suggestion of Adam, so uh, thank you, Adam, for, um, for that suggestion. We um, looked at the question of, of whether or not uh, the fellows were more attracted to uh, education and to a community of Spencer Foundation researchers uh, than they would have been if they hadn't received a fellowship. So we looked at AERA membership, uh, whether people got subsequent Spencer research grants, and for the pre-doc folks, whether they got uh, postdoctoral fellowships. And with that, I'll stop. Oh, maybe I should say a word about that. Uh, I, I will say, we looked at all of these things, and uh, <laughs> thank you, Adam. <laughs> Once again, <laughs> um, yeah, well, there weren't any effects on the people. No, that's not the answer. Uh, the answer was the consistent pattern of, of effects, bigger in some areas than others. It was interesting to us that uh, there was, the, the biggest effects came in areas like garnering research support and influence and, and editorial service. Uh, also on, on uh, these uh, outcomes that reflected being part of an education community. And these were things uh, that seemed to reinforce the notion that it wasn't just getting time off to be a fellow, uh, to write more stuff that was an outcome of the fellowship, but rather the kinds of social connections that the fellowship program through the NAE afforded the fellows. Um, but, the pat but there was a pattern uh, of, of sort of positive effects for all the outcomes we looked at. Probably the least positive effects were in, in, on uh, attaining uh, academic rank. Um, but there was a strong, for the pre-doctoral fellows, uh, fellowship program, there was a strong effect on completion. Uh, it turned out that it really mattered to get the fellowship in terms of whether you finished your PhD or not. That's not a surprise. Thanks, Larry. Um, so given the five to seven minutes that I have, rather than trying to boil down what was originally a 100-page report, it's condensed in this document, I'm going to tell a few stories. Well, the first story I want to tell is uh, revealed by Mike McPherson in this report. So if you haven't read it, you should still read it, even though I'm going to tell you the big story which is that the Spencer Foundation and its board uh, was very seriously considering eliminating the fellowships programs. They were not convinced that there was much of a payoff from the programs. Even though they had Larry's first 
regression discontinuity uh, analysis, which showed positive effects, as Larry just reported. Nonetheless, they weren't sure, and they're, they're, they weren't sure it was worth it. And there were a couple of reasons for this. Uh, well, and I'll get to those in a minute. Because the story I want to tell is that they asked me, and uh, I brought in uh, one of my students, now a faculty member at the University of Iowa, Sarah Brook, to help understand the fellowship programs in the context of human capital building efforts in education and social research. And placed in those contexts, I think, uh, showcases the value of the Spencer Foundation National Academy of Education fellowships programs. Because if you think about these programs as they give funds to somebody to finish a PhD, or they give funds to somebody to have a year's release from teaching so they can do research. If you conceive of the programs in that pretty narrow way, then you can understand why the value might not seem so great, why the payoff might seem so great. In fact, the argument, especially for the dissertation fellowships, was we're not actually funding the dissertation fellowship winners. We're funding the last student in the queue of the professors whose students are getting the dissertation fellows. Because student X, who wins a fellowship, that student would have been funded anyway by his or her faculty. I mean, these are the stars. So since we're funding that student, what's happening is somebody who is lower down in the queue, you know, there's a, do you see what I mean? Um, so that, that was the concern, that you really weren't getting a lot out of this. And um, uh, you can kind of see this in the analysis of the, whether students complete their doctorate. La Larry mentioned that there was a, a statistically significant difference between the fellowship winners and the finalists who didn't win in the reg regression discontinuity framework. But the difference in size is trivial. It was 92% of the finalists who didn't get the fellowship finished, 97% of the uh, fellowship of the finalists who do get the fellowship finished. So, you know, while statistically significant is that, does that justify the outlay? You know, wouldn't it be make more sense to just get rid of the fellowship programs and have more uh, open competitions for for grants? So th this was the kind of reasoning that um, was being brought to bear, and um, to the credit of the Spencer Foundation, they said, let's think about this more broadly and. So if there's any contribution that my co-author and I made, it was to help them think more broadly about the value of these fellowships programs. So we identified uh, 10 goals that went beyond just, I get some money and I do a piece of research with it. So um, uh, among, these, among these goals were, page 29, if you're reading at home, um, Okay, so enhance the productivity of emerging and developing scholars by allowing them to devote time to their research. That was the one that we knew about. But in addition, provide incentives to outstanding scholars to focus their research on education as opposed to other fields. And this is, again, especially for the dissertation fellows, what we're trying to do is find the best students and get them to focus on education. And this is uh, uh, about half of the, in the past at least, I don't know what it is today, but about half of the dissertation fellowships go to students who are enrolled in discipline, disciplinary doctoral programs. And so uh, inducing them, incentivizing them to focus their research on education is a big win for the field of education research since it attracts the, the strongest uh, st scholars to focus on the topic of education. Um, enhance the careers of the most outstanding uh, scholars by providing a signal of their quality. Now here's another one that people were skeptical about. They say, well, if there are any effects, is it actually because of their doing any work? Or is it because, you know, they've been a Spencer postdoc, so now everybody thinks they're great. Well, the argument here is that that can be one of the goals. You know, that, that's not uh, something to be discounted, but something to be valued. It's a signaling uh, device that uh, means that members of the National Academy of Education have reviewed both the quality of the scholar and the quality of the project and deemed it uh, among the most outstanding. Um, 
The third was, of course, the mentoring opportunities within the fellowships programs, which far exceed the, um, the uh, simply getting funds for research. So here again, so uh, there, there were qualitative uh, accounts attached to the review of the fellowship programs, which said um, what we like the most about being a Spencer Fellow is the mentoring opportunities. So uh, that led some people to say, great, why don't we get rid of the fellowship and just fund the mentoring? <laughs> and that was something that we took really seriously in our report because it was a serious contemplation. And the, the problem with that idea is that if you take that approach, then you, will, um, uh, you won't attract into the community the very people that you want to attract in because those people will get funding from some other source and they'll go do something else that won't bring them into this orbit. So it's the fellowship that brings them into the community and the mentoring enhances the opportunity they have. So uh, I'll just mention briefly some of the other goals. Um, create a cohesive cadre of outstanding and emerging developing scholars through networking activities. Uh, enhance the quality of education research by focused training for specific skills. Improve the quality of graduate pr preparation and education research by leveraging, uh, by leveraging graduate programs to produce outstanding scholars. Uh, increase the diversity of scholarship on education along the lines of the backgrounds of investigators, the array of institutions in which they conduct research, and the intellectual domains that they address. Build a community of scholars in the field of education at large and enhance the visibility of the foundation. So um, uh, after doing that, then we looked across a broad array of fellowship programs. We identified four key dimensions, whether the fellowship program was for an individual or targeted to an institution. Uh, whether it was um, targeted for a specific topic or broader in uh, the uh, focus of the research that was funded, uh, the career stage where it was pre-doctoral, post-doctoral, early career, mid-career, late career, and the duration of the fellowship and the intensity. Uh, so with re regard to duration, I'll just mention the Spencer Postdoctoral Fellowships and the William T. Grant Scholars Program. <laughs> which makes similar investments but in very different ways. Spencer awards about 20 fellowships of, it was 60,000 at the time of the uh, report, maybe it's more, maybe it's 70 now. Anyway, where, so they fund about, tw Spencer funds about 20 people for one year and William T. Grant, we fund um, five, four to six people for five years. And so in the Spencer Fellowships, you're creating a much larger cadre and you're focusing on bringing people into education research. The Grant Foundation, we're uh, focusing on taking a much smaller number of scholars and stretching their expertise over a broader range of uh, me methodologies and topics as a way of uh, enhancing their, their work. Um, the, the last comment I'll make is uh, we asked some reasons why the results that Larry produced were more positive than several other evaluations of fellowship programs that had been done previously on other types of fellowships, um, even though Larry's uh, research methods were more conservative in, the sense, conservative in the sense that they did a better job of taking account of pre-existing conditions. Why were the results more positive with a more conservative approach? And um, so we think there, there may have been a number of reasons. One is the wider range of outcomes that were examined, not simply time to degree, which is what most most previous evaluations looked at. Second, the scarce funding in education research, so it may make a bigger difference because funding is scarce than these other fellowship programs. And third, the program design where uh, the awards are made to individuals based on the work those individuals are doing rather than a block grant and then um, uh, uh, at the institutional level. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to speak to you today. When Marilyn first contacted me and uh, explained the prompt, I began to think about the concept of affect or effective labor as it's performed in the academy, which is a theme that one of my colleagues and I had been speaking about recently. And I couldn't seem to get away from that concept, so my response today is going to be focused around that notion of experience and the kind of emotion I felt as a postdoctoral fellow. And I think I was drawn in particular to this idea because of my work as a historian. Most historians tend to work alone 
in the archive. And so uh, being in a place like the academy where exchange is vital, I felt energized and I kept, kept tuning into that sort of emotive experience. And I also think it has a lot to do with the place that I work because I work in very deep South Texas, Corpus Christi, two hours from the U.S.-Mexico border, and very far and removed from the halls of academia when you think about um, where intellectual work and labor takes place in the United States. So I'd like to start um, by taking a moment to tell you that for me this is an achievement simply speaking, you, speaking to you here today uh, because I could have never imagined this idea as a child and certainly not as an undergraduate student. And I'm reminded in particular of my great-grandmother, San Juana Peña Casas, who came to the United States in the 1900s. She had no formal schooling. She spoke no English. She taught herself to read and write. And she worked as a maid for her lifetime. She also assisted her husband, who was a World War I veteran, helped him run a trucking business. She made a conscious decision to educate her children. And after four generations, my cousins and I can finally say that we've earned master's degrees, law degrees, and PhDs. So it is imperative for me to tell you, as I sit here today, that your intergenerational mentorship is critical. Critical because it has been essential to helping me learn the next steps of the profession. The value and the impact of the postdoc is historically significant to me personally and professionally in tangible ways. First, I'm tenured. The postdoc secured my tenure. My colleagues no longer questioned my ability to secure tenure and erase their doubts, their fears, and it allowed me to spend my tenure uh, year focused on my needs across the board. And this was particularly important because at my institution, the standard teaching load is 4-4. And it gets reduced if you have a research agenda to 3-3. So with the fellowship opportunity, I was out of there. <laughs> zero, zero. Thank you. <laughs> the postdoc also immediately shifted my institutional value and my scholarly reputation. My provost and my dean took notice of my work, as did editors of journals who now seek me out as an expert on the history of Chicana and Chicano education. And I'm also proud to say that the fellowship uh, gave recognition to um, me as an individual working uh, in a regional public institution. I was the only uh, postdoc in my cohort to come from a small university, small state school, and also the only postdoc in my cohort to come from a Hispanic serving institution. And I think that that's a, a new achievement for the academy. As I consider my life after tenure and after the postdoc, the National Academy constantly shapes the way I think about my future. Even though I was trained as both a gender and Chicana and Chicano Studies scholar, I cannot imagine my career without the history of education. After I finish my work on Arizona education, which has continued beyond the postdoc, I'd like to write histories of Mexican-American women teachers and to conduct oral history projects of Mexican-American students who experienced school desegregation in the 1970s and 1980s. And in fact, next week at the History of Education Society, I'll be meeting with a new group of scholars who focus on Latino and Latino education to reassess the status of the field as we begin to present new works um, that have continued, uh, literally the emergence of a field that only came about in the late 1980s. I know that in the back of my mind, in that subconscious zone where the imaginary ruminates, that the postdoc has reset my aspiration to build a career that will continue to garner the attention of the academy and of all of you. In terms of intergenerational professional development and, me development and mentoring, academy members have been incredible. Scholars who have worked closely with the Academy, AERA, and Spencer, who felt a commitment to intergenerational development, made concerted efforts to recruit me to the postdoc application. Scholars like Maria Victoria McDonald at the University of Maryland, who's been my mentor since graduate school, and also David Berliner at Arizona State University, where I did my graduate work. Upon my selection as a postdoc, NAED members reached out to me immediately, especially Michael Olivas, who continues to meet with me and correspond with me about my work. When he came to my campus last year to give a keynote address, the organizers asked him if there was anything he wanted to do in Corpus Christi, and he said, I want to meet Laura Munoz. 
That was a shock and awe moment for my colleagues. <laughs> and, it's, <laughs> and it's moments like that that have buoyed me uh, and become life rafts as I move through the profession. Last year at the annual meeting, I met Chris Gutierrez, Alfredo Artiles, and Ruben Donato, who after hearing my presentation immediately extended their support, and I know that I can rely on them for answers or advice on career development when I need it. These kinds of new alliances are especially critical to scholars like myself outside of the R1 institutions. When you are outside of the official networks of intellectual labor in this country, you have to work harder to build those connections and to remain connect connected. I was especially touched by Chris Gutierrez, who shared a chapter of my manuscript with her mother, who grew up in Arizona and attended, this, and attended the schools that I studied. Her mother's satisfaction with my work meant that I had achieved something relevant for Arizona Mexicanos. Even with the most minor engagements, an invitation to have a drink with you, as Bill Reese and his Wisconsin protégés did with me in 2011, or the extension of an invitation to share my work with you, which I hope to do one day with Judith Warren Litter, Little, who once offered to read my work on Mexican-American teachers. These moments have spirited me and encouraged me to continue my scholarship in the face of the insidious doubts and the exhaustion that often affects us in the profession. For me, the fellowship has helped me to recognize and validate the scope and impact of my work, which is often difficult to see as a junior scholar and as one learns to develop the authorial voice. During my postdoc year, John Meyer and Jonathan Zimmerman both reviewed my work, and they said to me something which I heard Maris Vinoskis uh, say to postdoc Rosina Lozano yesterday, and that is, wow. I don't know anything about the history of Mexican-American education. Professor Zimmerman specifically said that he had trained many students, read many manuscripts, virtually everything in the field of history of education, and my work was a first for him. Truly something new in historical scholarship. Maybe I'm hard-headed and I didn't get that message when I received the postdoc, but when he vocalized this opinion in public to my cohort, I finally felt that shift in my understanding of the importance of my scholarship. In closing, I'd like to say that one of the strengths of the postdoc program is its ability to bring together diverse sets of education scholars. This has allowed me to meet so many of you and to cultivate acquaintances and friendships like the ones I have with the postdocs who came after me, people like Manuel Espinosa and Rosina Lozano, that I'm happy to root for and excited to work with in the future. I'd also like to encourage the Academy to continue its pursuit of diversity in all of its forms and its recognition of the need to support Latina and Latino scholars as well as scholarship on the educational experiences writ large of Latino <laughs> students across the nation and the issues related to their schools and communities. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, thank you, Marilyn, for organizing this uh, panel and for inviting me as a participant. Thank you, Larry and Adam, for your, your work on the report. And as I look out and see the dwindling numbers of people, thank you all for, for persisting <laughs> until the last uh, plenary. Um, so as a researcher who's used to writing about other people, it was fascinating to read this piece and see myself uh, and my own experiences in this report. And for better or worse, I couldn't help but picture myself and my fellow cohort members um, as, I, as I read the report. Um, now, we know that all researchers are, are oftentimes critiqued for looking at everything in the world through their own analytical lens. Having acknowledged that typecast, I'm going to unabashedly do quite the same thing in the next few minutes. Um, in my own work, I look at ideological change in teachers, and the key dimension of this is looking at how teachers uh, develop a pro professional identity, particularly in uh, particular institutional contexts or communities of practice. So when I read the report and reflected on my own experience as a postdoc, I couldn't help but see my experience through a lens of professional identity. Um, it got me thinking about those aspects of the fellowship that might be highly influential in um, shaping the trajectories of postdocs, but are difficult to capture without in-depth interviews. So I'll frame my reflections in terms of what I found to be powerful identity-shaping experiences during the postdoc. Um, so I'd like to 
term the, fir um, the first set of identity shaping uh, experiences as appreciating intellectual risk. Uh, whether it was in formal conversations or meetings with mentors, informal discussions over dinner with academy members, or conversations with former fellows, I've come to appreciate a culture in these spaces that encourages genuine intellectual inquiry and risk taking. Uh, particularly as assistant professors, the message we most often receive at, in other spaces and our home institutions is to be strategic, to carefully plan for tenure. And this is undoubtedly important advice. However, it can also stifle intellectual passion and intellectual possibility to a degree. Um, personally, it's been of immense value to, to hear highly accomplished researchers talk about their choices and trajectories but also their false starts and their missteps, and, and thus legitimizing intellectual risk taking. So as I reflect on this dimension of my experience as a fellow, I wonder how our career trajectories are shaped within a culture um, that this fellowship promotes that, that um, encourages intellectual risk taking. I'd uh, term the second set of identity shaping experiences as engaging in a broader, broader educational discourse. Uh, my conversations with fellows, mentors, and academy members through the fellowship have truly been multidisciplinary. And I can't think of another professional space where this breadth of perspectives is represented and then people actually engage in conversation and dialogue. Um, so our work often encourages us to dig deep. Uh, the downside of this approach is that we can eventually find ourselves in a hole. And to, um, to carry that analogy just one step further, um, these fellowships allow us to resurface and to en engage the big issues in the field, uh, along with others who thoughtfully approach them from diverse perspectives. Um, so again, as I, as I reflect on this dimension of my experience as a fellow, I wonder how our trajectories are shaped by a culture that promotes engagement in broader educational discourses. Um, and, and the third and final set of identity shaping experiences that I'd um, uh, I'd term that as benefiting from intergenerational learning. And again, intergenerational learning is obviously a hallmark of any Spencer fellowships. And, but when I started the fellowship, uh, one of my primary objectives was to really connect with mentors who would push my thinking. Um, something I did not realize at this time, and as I mentioned before um, earlier in, uh, during the session, is that powerful mentoring is actually quite contagious. Um, and experiencing how invested others were in my growth led to a sense of wanting to pass it forward. And as a, as a junior faculty, having the opportunity to interact on an ongoing basis with new fellows and former fellows has been an incredible opportunity. Uh, so being a few years out of the postdoc is helping me to see the power of these fellowships, not only in terms of um, the mentorship that one receives during the, the fellowship, but in, notably in the intergenerational learning that's, uh, that continues afterwards. So while I wouldn't have been able to name it, um, name this quality when I was actually a fellow, I'm starting to see the significant difference between programs that promote or focus on mentorship and programs that really promote a sense of intergenerational learning. Um, so, so finally, as I reflect on, on, on this dimension of my, uh, my experience as a fellow, I wonder how our career trajectories are being shaped uh, by a sense of belonging to a community that values and, and perhaps socializes us before we even really figure it out um, into a culture of in intergenerational learning. Um, so the re reading the report was helpful, a helpful prompt to reflect on my experience as a postdoc and to think about these aspects of intellectual risk, engaging in broader um, educational discourse, and benefiting from intergenerational learning um, that were very powerful to my own experience. And if there's a, one way in which I could reshape the fellowship experience, it would be uh, pushing for more, creating more opportunities to carry on this intergenerational learning or professional development after the conclusion of the formal postdoc. Hi, everyone. So I'm clearly the runt of this academic litter, um, but I, I promise I won't talk very long, so don't worry. Um, th first of all, thank you very much for having me here. Um, it's always a pleasure to do anything related to the Academy or Spencer. Um, 
So as um, Marilyn said, I was a dissertation fellow in 2011, and although I'm only just over a year out, the experiences and connections that I've made during the fellowship year um, already impact my research and my life in many ways. And aside from the totally obvious one of just time to write and do research, I'll briefly mention a few. Um, relating to the literature, professional connections, validation, and then unseen advantages, or the signaling argument that Adam was talking about. Um, I recently began working on a new project and found myself reading work by people like John Meyer, Chiki Ramirez, Adam Gameron, and Bob Hauser, all of whom I met through one um, Academy or Spencer event or another. I felt a bit like a devotee who, who had worshipped from afar and then found herself actually talking to these <laughs> idols. Um, and meeting people like this makes the literature so much more approachable and human for me. Um, Spencer sponsored, and the Academy um, sponsored our attendance at AERA with, um, to attend a poster session for fellows. And this was a particularly useful experience for making connections. Um, I wandered around the room during the poster session and got to chat with several people I'd heard of before but had never met, um, rekindled relationships, exchanged contact inf information with people doing similar work to my own. And I don't know if Adam Gameron remembers this, but he um, recommended a very obscure book to me that proved uh, actually critical in responding to a reviewer's critique, so thank you for that. <laughs> um, and a postdoc fellow who I met at the very first um, retreat later sent me a newly published article of, by someone else who um, this article was actually perfect for reframing um, a paper that I had been working on, so very concrete benefits. Um, perhaps most importantly, the award was hugely validating and provided a priceless boost of confidence in my academic pursuits and I feel so much more like I might actually belong in academia, um, which is important um, given, given you know, where we tend to come from, um, and it continues to encourage me today. Um, as if these advantages weren't enough, the Academy and Spencer name opens a lot of doors without e even my knowledge. So papers from my dissertation are getting revised and resubmits at decent journals, and based on my very limited experience with this, it seems like such a crapshoot that I just know I'm getting a second or third look because of the, the award. Um, when I attend conferences, people actually approach me now sometimes. Um, one person came up and said he was a big fan of my work. And I'm not saying this to try to brag. I think that's all Spencer the, or the Academy, because how else would they know that I exist? So um, uh, I just want to read one very short quote. Some people are born on third base and go through life thinking they hit a triple. And that's, <laughs> that's a quote by Barry Switzer, who's a, prof a former professional football coach. Perhaps not the best type of person to quote in such an academic uh, setting, but I think it nicely illustrates some of the hidden benefits that I've gotten from the fellowship. Um, so I've talked about relating to the literature, professional connections, validation, and unseen advantages. I've given just a few examples of the many ways that Spencer has helped ease my path into academia. And like the quote by Switzer, Spencer put me on third base. Luckily, I know I didn't get there on my own. Um, we were also urged to identify some ways that maybe the fellowship could be improved. I must say I'm hard pressed to do that. I see these all as tremendous gifts that I would not have gotten otherwise. So I hope I can live up to all that the Academy has invested in me. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm going to stand up here. <laughs> just because <laughs> looking across these people, it's just, uh, I've been so moved by every single thing that I've heard, every aspect of these, of these stories, if you will. Whether, whether from the research or from people's perspectives. So I want to sort of think over and then raise some questions. Interestingly enough, my points are at least partially driven by the spectacular success of these programs. Based on the evidence presented here, it's fair to say that the, research of, of the receipt of a Spencer Fellowship in and of itself turbocharges individuals with regard to particular kinds of career criteria, the very crit uh, career criteria that are arguably becoming 
more and more important at the point of hiring, promotion, and tenure. And any of us who've been around for a while know this. It's arguably the case that findings related to the effects are intellectually parallel, or perhaps metaphorically parallel, to the growing body of work by scholars who suggest that where one goes to college, in this case, predicts persistence in graduation above and beyond the entering characteristics of admitted students. Evidence also suggests that selective institutions are better resourced than less selective institutions, with private research universities now rising head and shoulders above even the state flagship universities, and confer on their graduates both special entree to the best graduate and professional programs in the country and well-documented labor market advantages. As with persistence and graduation rates, these relationships hold, even when characteristics of entering students are, are held constant in the analysis. To be clear, I have absolutely no ax to grind with regard to highly selective institutions or the close to entirely group of private institutions deemed most competitive by barons, which every single privileged person, parent, kid in this country is looking at barons, okay? There are six publics in the 2009 and nine publics in the 2013 in the most competitive category of barons, which is a pretty large category. Again, no ax to grind, as these are often extraordinary places and admitted students work exceedingly hard to gain, to gain access to these institutions to get in and get out. The days of you know, goldfish swallowing and sort of just walking <laughs> around gentleman sees and all that pretty much are over and people are very, very serious about the kind of work they do in these institutions. Having said this, anyone who's had anything to do with these schools at all knows that opportunities to create future success are deeply embedded within the institutions themselves. And this is not just a matter of signaling. Yale is Yale to be sure, but the mechanisms born within schools like Yale or other schools to build a dossier that lays the foundation for <laughs> one's future graduate and professional studies and ultimately one, one's career are notable. Well-funded alumni programs, P55 at Princeton, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that enable recent graduates to work in South Africa for a year while gaining important cultural and social capital linked to being a world citizen, which is now a key attribute and a class marker, as well as engaging marked opportunities to gain important skills while ultimately having something to write about in later law, medical, graduate school, or other admissions essays, offer a pathway to a level of future and professional engagement and position that goes well beyond signaling. There are actual mechanisms in place wherein students who attend these institutions are in fact able to persist, graduate, gain opportunities for extraordinary dossier building, experiences that systematically scaffolds future possibilities. Such possibilities do not thickly characterize state institutions, no matter how relatively privileged any given state institution may be. My point here is that receiving a Spencer dissertation or postdoc is comparable. And while all those who receive prestigious fellowships definitely work hard, certainly deserve every bit of social and economic capital that accrues as a result of prestigious programs, we must ask the question on our end, how are we creating a class? And by that I mean we must ask the same question that institutions are asking as they put together a law school class, graduate student class, undergraduate class, and so forth. In the case at hand, what are the criteria through which our class is created, a class that we know based upon these extraordinary data. And if you haven't read that report, please do so. I mean, it's a really extraordinarily informative and well done report. Based on the data today, absolutely turbocharges a group of people while simultaneously accomplishing exactly what the Spencer Foundation or any foundation would want out of its funding. It's a very good investment. We know that from the data. So let's first quickly look at the numbers. I'm not going to look at the postdoctoral fellowships as I don't have the data from, on institutions from which recipients received their PhD, only their institution of current employment. Looking at the dissertation grantees for 2013 reveals that over 70% are from institutions that can be categorized as elite privates. Fewer than 30% are from publics, of which half are from Berkeley. And all but one of the remainder are from the research ones. Okay, these are the 2013 data. I did ask Philip for the data from prior years, which I'm going to talk to you about in a minute. But um, thank you very much for these data. Spencer dissertation grantees are overwhelmingly from a very small subset of universities. And a very high proportion is doing, are doing their PhDs at the most prestigious privates in the nation. 
Looking across the years 2010, 11, and 12, and 13, we see that although the proportion of public versus private institutions fluctuates somewhat year by year, if we use three or more grantees over the four-year period as our criterion, dissertation fellows come from a very, very narrow band of schools. Harvard, Stanford, Berkeley, Northwestern, University of Chicago, TC Columbia, University of Michigan, and Penn. If we up the criteria to more than 10 awardees over the same time period, fellows come from three institutions. Um, excuse me, Harvard, Stanford, and Berkeley. Okay. This means that of, of the to 100 total awards, approximately 25 per year over a four-year period, almost half are awarded to institutions who come from eight schools in the nation, and close to a third of the awardees come from three schools in the nation. I know firsthand, because I've been on this committee, that selection committees are very, very thoughtful about this and do not simply revert to simplistic sim signaling when making awards. The problem is, and we don't just look at Harvard and say, oh my God, we have to give this person a fellowship. It's really, really, people take this very, very seriously. The problem is that an architecture of capital accumulation enables certain group within certain institutions to actually produce the data at hand. This leads to a very small stratum of institutions that ultimately are able to garner a notably disproportionate share of awards over time. Grantees are outstanding. I mean, I've been involved in this now for a couple years, and I am incredibly impressed with everyone that I have met at this meeting. Um, they're, they're trained, but they're mentored by the best, taught by the best, everything, and, and they're quite amazing. I have no problem with this situation, particularly since such schools now take seriously the diversification of their own incoming classes as they build a class such that there's some representation, at least, of varying groups in the population at top, top doctoral programs throughout the nation. We are going to have to keep our eye very carefully on this situation, however, because depending on what happens with, with all of you know, so the implementation of the Supreme Court decision around these things and, and what's going on at universities, this, this situation may markedly change within the next five years. Having said this, we must frankly consider the mechanisms through which winning dossiers are produced and the <coughs> possibilities that others, individuals and institutions, could ever seriously compete in this kind of context. Certain institutions are quite frankly thicker with respect to human and material capital that can be collectively deployed toward mentoring and supporting student applications. There are good scholars everywhere, but certain institutions have well-formed collectivities in one or more identifiable scholarly areas. And this richness, if you will, enables the universe, individuals from particularly located institutions to be far more competitive than others. For example, knowledge is not equally distributed among faculty with what, regards, what, what constitutes writing a winning letter. I mean, some faculty know these things, other faculty do not, and there tends to be more of that kind of capital sitting in certain kinds of institutions because they learn how to do it. They talk about it. Although we have recently stopped this practice, faculty recommenders were previously asked to comment on the extent to which any given applicant favorably compares to prior fellowship recipients with whom they've worked. Although there was certainly nothing intentionally nefarious about that question. Every time I say things like that, people raise their hand and say, yes, there was. But, but actually, I really believe that there isn't anything intentionally nefarious about things. It's not a plot to privilege those with privilege. And at some level, it even makes good investment sense. This obviously privileges applicants from those, those institutions that have a history of getting these kinds of grants. Letters count, and they count a lot. And certain faculty know, by virtue of their own located uh, position in the structure of opportunities at the graduate level, how to write them. Similarly, individu in, individually constructed dossiers count, and they count a lot. It's students at a relatively small strata of institutions get the, understandably, get the kind of thick advice that they need in order to put forth a dossier that is at least competitive. And, and some, I mean, there are groups that, that, that embody these kinds of things, and I, I don't blame them. That's good. That's positive, not negative. But those kinds of groups and those kinds of understandings are not just widely distributed outside of certain institutions. Um, uh, others can't and don't, but they may be equally as smart and at some level equally or more accomplished, giving possibilities available in their own level, in their own graduate programs relative to other students in other programs. So the question is to what extent is this important? As long as our recipients do as well as the data suggests, and I think this is clear from these wonderful data that Larry and Adam have given us, plus the stories that we're hearing from these amazing people, 
Um, why should we care that grantees stem almost entirely from a narrow band of institutions? And that's an honest question. Such applicants are, in fact, highly meritorious. For example, a very high proportion of award winners enter the competition with a corpus of notable publications in Times and Tier 1 journals. I edited AERJ, and I was getting uh, uh, papers from people who were actually uh, a, a recipient of certain kinds of, of experiences, and they were submitting, as graduate students, or perhaps as postdocs, they were submitting these, the, they were submitting to these journals, and some people were actually getting published. And an already established record of grant work by virtue of association with teams of grant-worthy faculty at particular schools. Knowing that we're further turbocharging a group of people who are already turbocharged by virtue of where they attend graduate school does or not, does not bother us, okay? Honest and open question. I'm just going to, I don't have much time, so I'm going to make one last comment. Spencer advertises the fellowship programs broadly. Okay? They do a very good job of this. And, I, and in fact, they offer outstanding webinars, which everybody should be looking at. I sat in recently on the doc and postdoc one, and they are really amazing. For all interested in individuals, individuals at any doctoral granting institution, faculty or student, can theoretically access these excellent webinars and position themselves for fellowships. However, we all know that access in and of itself does not translate into equal opportunities. By exercising facially neutral policies and practices, in other words, a policy or practice that is neutral to all affected groups, for example, anybody can access the webinars and position for the fellowships, do we perhaps unintentionally perpetuate and increasingly exacerbate, given the context in which we're living and working, institutional and linked inequalities? As such policies do not acknowledge, or probably cannot acknowledge or take advantage into account that a particular class, and I'm using the term differently there, of students is negatively impacted by virtue of prior background and position within the structure of opportunities that is itself now intensifying in higher education. Although this is certainly not the intent of these grant programs. Absolutely not. To what extent do we work hard enough to interrupt these eventualities or to put it another way, what become normative outcomes with respect to these kinds of selection processes? perhaps thinking carefully about how we might democratize access for such fellowships without compromising quality in any way at all would be a useful starting point. So one question is, what are the multifaceted purposes of these grants? What, what, what ultimately are we trying to do when we distribute these amazing opportunities? I just want to make one really quick comment, and I'm sure it will be said elsewhere as well, or I will bring it up. Um, I, I don't know how we do. Okay, inequalities are being maximally effectively maintained everywhere. It's very difficult to break into this with notions of, uh, you know, upending facially neutral policies and practices. I mean, that's not anything. I'm really not naive. However, if, if one little tiny thing we could do, I think, is to lots and lots and lots of people at AEIA, for instance. And it would be really nice to have something, round tables, something, sessions, much like some of you got. And I think it would be very, very good, excuse me, thank you. Very good if we at least were able to garner some sessions where we could give more information to more people. It may or may not, they don't even know about the webinars. It may or may not impact those people immediately in terms of receipt of a fellowship, but down the line we're offering amazing information to people that they otherwise would not have. And we did this at, for AERJ. We had a lot of round tables and they were really, really great. So I wish I had the answer to this, but my task was to open this for discussion. Thank you very much. So as I said at the beginning, our intention here was to bring a variety of perspectives to this whole topic of the fellowship programs, to invite people to open up different ways of thinking and looking at them, raise different kinds of questions. So. We now would like to thank you all for keeping within a really short amount of time. I know everybody had way more that they wanted to say. So um, it, you can direct your question to any of the panelists or a particular one, please. That was fabulous and really inspiring. I'm Lindsay Chase Lansdale from Northwestern University and a happily newly elected member. I feel the same way. It's a really wonderful cloud descended out of the sky. I'm very interested in uh, these programs and in targeting exactly what Laura Munoz mentioned. Traditionally, Latina serving universities and colleges and tradi traditionally historically black colleges. What does Spencer do about that? And then my second question is, 
I'm also a big fan of keeping networks and infrastructure together after fellowships end, and it can be a lifelong infrastructure, and I'd love to hear more about what's happening along those lines. We may, we're going to call on some people in the audience who know the answer to some of these issues better than perhaps our panelists, or, although you are all invited. So Chris is going to say something in response to this to start with. So a number of years ago, Spencer partnered with AERA to have a pre-doc program. And I was lucky enough to be on that committee and chair it for a long time. And what we found in the first couple of years is the same pattern. The same, especially then the, uh, the 10 RTG, Spencer-supported schools. Got, those students received all the scholarships, all the fellowships. So at that time, um, we actually raised it and we made a decision to exclude for this particular fellowship, because there were the Spencer dissertation and others, to exclude the RTG top 10 schools. Um, and we got a completely different population of excellent students, many of them um, scholars of color um, or women, and coming from different kinds of institutions. And I'll bet, just because I remember so many of them, if we followed their trajectories, we would, we would find that they are uh, had stellar careers that were very much aligned with the kind of um, trajectories that students we fund. So that was a conscious decision that we made, and it may call for a new program or a new way of thinking about um, how do we not just recreate right, the same pool, but how could we really open up opportunities for other students? Which doesn't really answer your question, except give us a good possibility for a direction we might want to think about. Uh, Greg, do you mind if I put you on the spot? Could you just say a couple of words about how this is advertised and who it reaches and so on? So I think we're very conscious in terms of um, broad outreach and disseminating uh, information to, you know, listservs and uh, networks. I know that we specifically um, advertise on publications and um, try to communicate with historically black colleges and other Hispanic networks. But I think, Lois, what you're encouraging us to do is um, that's not as active as actually going out and, and being present in and, and, um, uh, net, more networked events and, and symposia. And I think uh, we should look more deeply at that. And then there are the structural changes, which maybe we can also look at um, that I think might be more difficult to do, but we could talk about, uh, you know, do we reserve certain, you know, fellowships or do more targeted things? I think that's more difficult. But what we certainly can do is, is to do more face-to-face -face, uh, outreach. So. David? Uh, this is a, a data-free comment, I think, but <laughs> it should not be assumed or concluded however, that just because a lot of awards go to the ones that Lois mentioned, that those awards necessarily go to um, uh, uh, majority students, that, that uh, the distribution of, of uh, ethnic and linguistic minorities amongst uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, institutions that have a lot of awardees are often quite diverse. So um, I don't know those data, but I would imagine just knowing some of the people who've gotten awards from uh, my own institutions, I, I think it's a pretty diverse group. David, I think that's true. I think there is a difference between sort of, excuse me, privileged people, I don't know what the origin is, but privileged people across race and ethnicity and language of origin and what have you that, that are in particular kinds of institutions and different institutions. And in no way do I mean to conflate those two. I think privileged institutions have done pretty well in diversifying some aspects of their entering classes. Uh, I'm Andy DeSessa from one of those privileged institutions, <laughs> Berkeley. And uh, this started out as a tongue-in-cheek comment, but just a thought that passed through my mind. And then as I was ruminating here, it became very, it became very serious and live to me. And that is, I was wondering if Larry would do a study of the effect of these programs on mentors, on faculty, on, uh, on us. 
And, uh, and then I was thinking, gee, I just wrote a note about a piece of advice that I wanted to give to a student with respect to career trajectory from, from being here. I have very much appreciated the opportunities to be uh, labeled a mentor, to, uh, to uh, try to be helpful to people, to just to have that opportunity to come to these meetings and meet somebody that I would never have met otherwise. Um, I really appreciated being on the uh, postdoctoral committee, fretting terribly about diversity in the field, particularly in science education. Uh, so it's a it's a reminder. It's an opportunity to think and talk about talk about those issues. So so it, it turns out that I think I'm serious about the effect of these programs on us. I actually have a question, so if we're done with that answer, <laughs> uh, we, could, we could move on. But I... Let me just say one thing. So it seems to me that this whole issue raises really important questions. We probably don't have enough data. This is an analysis that Lois did quickly, just looking at sort of a small amount of data just to raise some questions and be provocative, which I think she has been. Thank you. That was my job. <laughs> okay. Yes, that's, that's right. We ask her specifically to do that. So it seems to me that these are issues that the Professional Development Committee would want to consider. And certainly if there were uh, proposals about uh, allocating certain num this would be a huge topic of discussion for the executive board, perhaps guided by some proposals from the Professional Development Committee. Catherine, are you still on this same topic? Yeah. I mean, this is an obvious point, and I'm sure you would have thought of it, but um, some institutions have admittedly better structures for supporting applications, so the number of applications from those um, privileged institutions has to be offset against the number of, um, uh, of winners, so to speak, from those institutions. And if then studying what those institutions do to support applications might be a worthwhile uh, source of information to less uh, well set up uh, graduate schools of education. Okay. Fred, are you on this topic as well? Uh, yeah, actually okay, I was going to say something else, but I, uh, just following on what, what you said, something occurred to me. Um, I actually got an email over the last, uh, a couple emails over the last uh, month from an applicant from, I won't say the name of the country, but it's an, uh, someone uh, from overseas uh, who asked me to read um, their statement applying for a postdoc uh, uh, and uh, give them feedback on it. And this is part of the social capital that the, the privileged institutions have, that, as Lois pointed out, um, it's it might very well be that that we could um, um, so, somehow uh, um, the National Academy could, um, if if people would volunteer, make a list available so that people who aren't at such a privileged place, who don't have an advisor, who knows how to you know, craft the thing. I mean, the, this person was asking some questions about uh, will they think, you know, my work makes sense and whatnot. And, and uh, uh, it's, it's uh, that might be a, a, a very simple way to, uh, to, to expand uh, uh, the, the thing, uh, access to that kind of uh, m mentoring at that point. Is going to make one more comment on this topic and then we're going to you. Promise. So I, th I think that that's a really good suggestion. In fact, um, some of the AERA divisions have done that in the past. Um, I've been on those committees that they did that in the past. Part of the 
problem if we decide to do that is making sure people know about it. So one place might be the webinar because again, it's often the people who, with the social capital who end up taking advantage of those opportunities. So I think we have to be really sure that we get the word out widely if we're gonna do it. And I think it's a great idea. Uh, so I had a question about, uh, so I, when I got the fellowship, I used to work for the New York Hall of Science. And um, while the rhetoric oftentimes said, you, you can take off from classes uh, and, you know, we'll support this. So when I went to my CEO and I said, you know, I got this fellowship and she supported it and she actually gave me great feedback and Margaret was really great. Um, and uh, uh, she didn't know what to do with me. Uh, because limited space, it was in the New York Hall of Science, uh, uh, limited space, so she just couldn't give me a desk and say, okay, you be here. Uh, sh she sort of tried to work it out, uh, and it didn't, and I quit my job. Uh, ultimately, that seemed like the best solution because uh, uh, of the kind of work I was doing. And So I appreciate that Spencer does this thing wherein they're funding non-academic agencies like the Hall of Science, and I do know of a fellow who was... Uh, funded like a couple of years ago from the Institute of Ecosystem Studies. Um, and uh, I, but I feel like, you know, uh, there could have been some conversation about what to do it at the Hall of Science when you get the fellowship. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and that would have been terribly helpful. Uh, not that I'm unhappy, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I just felt like it would have been helpful. I'd like to respond to your comment. I think that's an important point that that um, that the academy needs to give a little bit more direction to to scholars who are coming from uh, who are coming from outside of the universities or from institutions that are very unfamiliar with the fellowship process. And so, uh, my institution didn't know what to do with me either. Uh, my uh, fellow. One of my colleagues, another woman historian, both of us won fellowships in the first year, and we became essentially the guinea pigs for our institution to develop a fellowship policy because they didn't know what to do with scholars. And I think that there needs to be uh, some kind of apparatus in place in those instances to create uh, opportunities for, for scholars like you and I who, who have to figure that out. Thanks. So I want to um, just add some two cents on this conversation. As somebody who's faculty now, also at a, a Hispanic-serving institution, although it's a private one, and uh, at the University of Miami, but came from one of the privileged institutions as a doctoral student. And so I've kind of seen both. And everything that you expressed, Laura, about your experience, I, I felt like you were sort of saying my story in so many ways. And um, so one suggestion around outreach maybe because there, as a graduate student, being able to rely on my advisor, and even though I'm a postdoc fellow, so I was already at this other institution, but I knew of this culture and I knew who I could rely on and who would give me the right advice and who I could count on. And that doesn't quite exist at where I am now. Mm -hmm. Even though we get the emails that these fellowship programs are open and it's forwarded to all of the faculty and it's forwarded to all the doc students. It's just sort of a different world. And I don't know if this is feasible, maybe as a program, but I wonder if there could be um, more in-person outreach to institutions that serve, uh, minority-serving institutions around. I'm here to visit with the faculty as mentors and with the doctoral students, and this is what this program is, and this is why it's important, and here are resources you can find on what a winning application looks like or a, support, a letter of support looks like, and if you have faculty or doc students who get this, this is why it's important to support them and um, you know, negotiate around their, their, their course releases and, and things like that, because I think that would actually go a really long way. I think everybody's open to it, but there just isn't the same kind of culture around it, so. Um, to speak to Jenny's point in particular, um, I think UC Accord in California does a great job of that. They actually come to all of the UC campuses and have seminars um, with faculty that have developed the scholarship, and I find that the representation of diverse students in that is 
extremely high, and the type of work they do is high, very, very high quality. So that might be a model that we can emulate as well. Um, so I came from one of the institutions that gets a lot of Spencer Fellows, but I'm now at one that doesn't. And um, I think it's been really helpful, this idea of paying it forward, and I'm hearing a lot of that. But it's actually hard to know how to do that well. So for instance, I had a student really, at Temple we have a lot of first generation college graduates and then go on to doctoral studies, and some of them are really strong, but they don't have the polish that you know people from Penn have, and I don't know how to necessarily be as helpful for them. So I'm thinking it might be helpful for in the sort of sessions that are set up around mentoring or kind of professional development to help us know how to mentor the next generation. Because I, I feel a real responsibility, and I don't know that I do it as well as I could. And I've gotten, I want to give back because I've gotten such good mentoring. So there are, all, there are a whole lot of really good suggestions. I hope someone's writing these all down. <laughs> Thank you. So I just want to echo Maya's point because um, I, when I got it, I started counting how many postdoc fellows we have. Um, I think I was the fifth in my department of roughly 25, and now we have a sixth and, and a new academy member. Um, so the faculty, I think, are doing really great work, but I, I can't think of a doctoral student who's gotten one. And I don't know what, I, I'm not, it's puzzling to me, and I'm not quite sure what to do about that, because I know the faculty are really committed mentors. Yeah, and so there's sort of the, in trying to figure out the status thing, I think the postdoc versus the pre-doc thing, there are very different dimensions at play. I don't have an answer, but I just sort of offer that as a data point that's, I've been sort of trying to ruminate and, and puzzle over. I'd like to respond to your comment, because one of the things I was thinking about was um, the group that was not selected. Every year there's a massive applicant pool, but do we, do we really look at who does not get selected? What were the deficits of their applications? Where are they coming from? Maybe, maybe we are attracting students uh, or scholars from uh, HSIs and HBCs, but for some reason they're not moving through, um, that through they're not making success at the application level, and what, what's preventing that? or uh, scholars from other types of institutions that can bring and add as much diversity and difference to the academy as well. So maybe looking at that data set would be important. So Larry, when you did the um, compared those who didn't get the fellowship, was, was there any insight from that? Uh, I, don't, I, I just don't know the answer to that. One, one caveat especially is that I really only worked with the group that made it to the semifinals. So there were half the applicants, you know, were taken out uh, before I, I mean, well, they were there, but I didn't look at those. So I, I think that's an interesting thing for, you know, yeah. to, for, for some of us to have a look at. Yeah. I think it would be important. So my name is Travis Bristol. I'm a current uh, dissertation fellow. So as we think about maybe um, sort of next steps, um, one maybe suggestion might be um, sort of highlighting the types of projects that are funded. So um, when I was thinking about applying, my research interests are around black male teachers, uh, black male teacher retention. And initially, I was very skeptical of the academy funding something around black male teachers. But I, I went on the website and I saw that maybe two years ago, someone had received funding um, around uh, Mexican teachers. And so I thought, oh, maybe this, clearly the Academy is interested in, in sort of um, issues around race and, and, and sort of diversity. Um, and sort of maybe focusing on the types of projects that are funded might also be helpful in, um, in um, supporting faculty uh, around some of their sort of expectations that they might have of, of students. So we're thinking less about expectations of students and more around the ideas that, that sort of students can present. So in, in getting this, I think it's really uh, changed the, um, the, the ways in which some of my, my uh, faculty members at my, my school have sort of seen and viewed my, my work. The, um, oh, I'm sorry. I have a mic, so I'm going to um, oh, Very, very quickly. Um, I know that I, I haven't been involved in this program for a while, but there are always applicants who um, lose the postdoc cut who might apply the next year and sometimes do and sometimes are very successful and probably should have been chosen the first time. But often I think people get better at figuring out how to present their application. And I, 
I don't know whether there's any feedback for people. I mean, I know there's this really difficult thing about giving feedback in that kind of a, a situation, but the academy might think about how people could help, you know, people think about reapplying. We do it in journals. I mean, we all expect to get an R&R, &R &R and then you figure out what's next. And so that doing something, I, I don't know what you do, but I think probably we could be more helpful um, with people. Yeah. So, so Hilda has been the chair of the postdoc selection very recently, so she's going to speak to that. So that's actually been a discussion for the four years I was on the committee. And there's a pretty strong sentiment not to do that because of how much work the committees already do and being afraid that we're not going to be able to get people on the committee. What we've tried to do more and more is we, have, we construct a letter that's fairly detailed about the kinds of differences between successful and unsuccessful or almost successful. And we work really hard at that letter. I'm not saying that it's enough, but, but so far that's been all that the committee has the sort of energy to muster. And I think we can keep working on that, or the committee can keep working on that. I had one other request, though, which is I'm trying to take notes. My guess is that Chris and other people on the, on the um, professional development committee are trying to take notes. But when you fill out the evaluations, please put down your suggestions for us, because we really will get the suggestions and try to pay attention to them. Um, I should just give a little history um, that at one time we did um, follow up, and it was a different committee um, that uh, worked with the rejected applicants. Shirley Heath uh, led that effort. Um, and so maybe it's a time to revisit that uh, possibility. But I will also note, defensively, that the um, postdocs are not quite, I mean, there is a very serious issue of privilege and who knows how to do it well, but the postdocs are not as quite as narrowly uh, located as uh, the data that Lois shared. Fred? Uh, th this is changing the frame slightly, but uh, I had wanted to make a comment about um, uh, post postdoc kind of uh, uh, continuing um, the networking as as somebody mentioned uh, earlier from the panel, um, and and a, a couple of things occurred to me. I mean, there's some very simple things uh, way back. Um, Lee Shulman wanting to have researchers on teaching getting together around the country created uh, um, a, an invisible college um, which uh, met on the day before AERA and uh, was a way of a whole cohort of people, uh, actually intergenerational uh, thing, um, that went on for, for some years and was very, yeah, it's still going on. But I mean, it had tremendous uh, impact in the first 10 years of its life. Um, and Andy and I have been involved uh, with a, a doctoral fellowship program called DIME, the Diversity in Mathematics Education Program, which was across a number of universities. And um, the, uh, the, those people are all now finished with their, their PhDs, but they have listservs, they have all kinds of ad hoc gatherings at math ed meetings and various other places where people show up and they're giving each other mentoring support and I mean it's really um, they have they have connected in an impressive way and it's becoming sort of a movement uh, and it would be I think quite easy to foster some more of that you know maybe even just invite alums um, here or do something at area and then finally the other really important place that some of this happens already, which shows how easy it is, is the Spencer reception at AERA every year, right? I mean, that's not trivial. And by just tweaking something like that a little more, 
uh, we could really keep keep the uh, the alumni in the loop. Uh, yeah, we've gotten a lot of feedback along those lines from fellows and from members of the academy. So I think we're definitely the PDC is definitely going to take up these issues. We we have time. We have to close. So I'm going to go way back there, and then an, there's another the two fellows, please. And that's going to have to be the end, I'm afraid. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Buckner. Um, so I am at Stanford, and I was just thinking uh, about what you said. And one of the, the privileges that we have at Stanford is getting funding to attend conferences. And I assume, I mean, three conferences, and it's generous. And it allows us to attend AERA. And I just think that that is something that not all doctoral students have. And it really facilitates networking prior to application and whatnot. So I, and I think that would be a small possible with a high return on investment and that, you know, if, if there was a small um, travel fellowship uh, program. Oh, so that's another suggestion. Okay. So I have just a, a very simple suggestion and it has to do with what we state on the homepage of the academy for um, the applications. Um, perhaps just a simple note of saying we welcome applications from um, a variety of institutions, maybe been saying, not just Research One. Um, so I come from Grinnell College, a small liberal arts college, and I um, emailed Phil before applying to say, do you even accept people from liberal arts colleges? Because I looked at the past recipients and was doubtful that that was the case. Um, and I also want to just praise Phil because he really helped me also in the ne negotiation process by connecting me with Jen, who was a, another uh, past recipient of the postdoctoral fellowship from a liberal arts college. So that kind of connecting was extremely helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Unfortunately, we're going to have to close. It's after 12. Um, Michael, do, this is our final session. I assume you have some profound words to send us forward to our lunch. Um, well, then, I'll say, please join me in thanking the panel once again. It was a wonderful presentation. Thank you all.